Hello, Pete, my friend. How are you? I'm fine, Thomas. How are you today? I am great, and I do have a question for you. Okay, let's try it. You know the film Godzilla, right? Big lizard monster? Yeah, several of them. Yes, a lot of them, yes. And have you heard of the movie Them! Exclamation point. Mmm, that's delicious ants, right? <laughs> that is. Weirdly, I'm not afraid of them, even though they're 18 <laughs> feet tall. It's the little ones that get me. But yeah, these giant 18 foot tall ants. So we have a giant lizard creature and we have giant 18 foot tall ants. But Pete, what was Godzilla and them, exclamation point, really about, would you say? Uh, uh, well, uh, about technology. Correct. About the cultural impact of technology and how damaged we all are as a result. Exactly. It was a fallout of, <laughs> good word, a fallout from atomic testing yeah, that had right. been done. Uh, and so in that way, yes, popular culture often reflects the current anxieties of our time. Horror films, are, of course, are a big way to see that. Mm -hmm. And over the last couple of years, I've been noticing a new canon of literature has become enormously popular. And by I noticed it, I read a couple articles. <laughs> uh, and it's really this uh, canon, this genre is really dealing with the anxieties being felt by a certain part of our society. And this part of our society is known as, hold on. I think it's in my notes. Ah, yes. Women. <laughs> have you heard of women, Pete? <laughs> I have no idea where you're going to go with this. The genre, and it's been around for decades, but it is really blowing up now. It is feminist dystopian fiction. And why I bring it up in the cold open is because it is clearly dealing with the rampant anxieties and fear that women in our society around the world are currently having. Oh. Um the genre itself, um, it usually it has stories that usually take place in the future, but like Godzilla and them, exclamation point, they're clearly channeling uh, anger and fear that's being felt now. Uh, uh, older writers like Octavia Butler and uh, more recent but still classic writers like Margaret Atwood have been writing, as I said, for decades. But it is really, really blowing up, especially more and more now as more women are speaking out against sexual assault and harassment, and I just read that a record number of women are getting involved in politics and running for office. Have you read some of these kind of books? I, this genre I have. I, mean? I yeah. have, but I have to stop and say, as soon as you started talking about it, is it is it telling that I was just overwrought with this feeling of anxiety and grief and guilt and yes. just just because of what I look like, is that is that <laughs> is that a rational response to whatever you're talking about? It absolutely is. I would hope that, Pete, you and I are not a part of the problem or at least not a huge part of the problem. I'm sure we've been accidental assholes. Oops. Can we <laughs> can we say assholes? Probably That's not. That's actually the new name of this podcast. The accidental assholes. <laughs> but that being said, um, a huge um, uh, the majority of these books are really about in a way, expressing toxic masculinity as being literally toxic, <laughs> that uh, there are books about outbreaks of viruses that only that men give to women. And so women have to isolate themselves. Um, one that I was just reading about, uh, Christina Dolcher's recent debut novel, Vox, it has to do with, ooh, listen to this, this is <laughs> severe. An ultra conservative political party gains control of Congress and the White House and enacts policies that force women to become submissive homemakers. Girls are no longer Longer taught how to read or write women are forbidden to work or hold political office or even express themselves they are forced into near silence after the government requires all women to wear bracelets that deliver a shock if they exceed an allotted daily word count wow <laughs> that obviously is extremely severe but incredibly telling and this is just one of these kind of books uh, and many of them are being long listed already on the man for the man booker prize these are serious serious works and it just says so much about how awful it has been i can only imagine uh for women for so long and it's incredible that they have it's incredibly important that they have their voices and that their voices are being heard more and more now and mostly that it is the women who are going to leave earth because if i were a woman why wouldn't i <laughs> they all it, there's a lot of leaving men behind there's a lot of yeah. isolating themselves on islands and doing a lot better as a result sleeping yeah. beauties i just read with uh, stephen king wrote it with his son owen king and it has to do with exactly that that women just slowly start um sort of freezing in place and in to us they just seem like mummies to them they have been transported to this sort of idyllic other universe. <laughs>
<laughs> where it's just women and women being women, and it sounded magical. And of course, back on Earth, all the men are like, and like knocking things over <laughs> with their penises, and it's so it's like the worst. So I get it. Um, again, as I said, this has been around for a really long time, but again, uh, to shine one more light on its prevalence right now, Mag- Margaret Atwood, of course, wrote the 1985 novel The Handmaid's Tale, uh, which, if you haven't read it, is set in a future theocratic state where women are treated as reproductive slaves. It's obviously a classic. It's a huge TV series right now. And just in 2017, it sold more than 3.9 million copies in the United States. Mm. So that, I mean, this kind of genre really has its finger on the pulse of what at least half of humanity is going through. So get ready. Men, yeah. we're on our own, and it doesn't look good. <laughs> I'm going to write my own response fiction, and it's just going to call, we want more stuff! <laughs> we already are a dystopia. <laughs> we're a dystopia in pants. That's exactly right. So, I'm sorry, women, thank you for these books. They are incredible. And one, if it's a nice way to sort of end it up on a hopeful note, uh, I read a quote that uh, Margaret Atwood did say, She says she is comforted to see a growing number of people reading and writing dystopian fiction, a scenario, of course, that would be impossible if we actually had a totalitarian government that banned this kind of impression. She said, quote, the mere fact that you can read it means we're not there yet. And the big word is yet. Written in all caps and bold. (laughs) Exactly. And actually, there may have been air quotes around it. (laughs) Yes, exactly. You can see her do a little wink. So buy up those books now, everybody. (laughs) Dystopia in pants! Welcome to What's That Smell, a sometimes funny podcast about humans and their anxieties. I'm Tommy Metz III. And I'm Pete Wright. And every week, we drag one of our deepest, darkest anxieties into the light to share it, learn about it, and hopefully laugh about it with all of you. Reach out, send us the story of your anxiety to something stinky at what's that smell.net. Something stinky. Oh, what's that smell? Dot net. Yeah, dig it in there. Mm. You're an idiot. <laughs> hey, Tom, that reminds me. I have something stinky to share. Gross. <laughs> share it to yourself, <laughs> you creep. Now we're one with the sun over our heads. And at night we'll be the stars. We can go any place that we want to. I don't care if that's too far. Uh, Tommy, you're familiar with the podcast, The Anthropocene Reviewed. No, I'm not even familiar yeah. with those words. <laughs> reviewed, I, I hope that you're oh, a little bit that familiar one with the, that one. Yeah, and I the, got those. You have some familiarity with that. The Anthropocene, yeah. uh, it, the, the description of the Anthropocene reviewed is that the Anthropocene is the current geological age in which human activity has profoundly shaped the planet and its biodiversity. Here on the Anthropocene Reviewed, we review different facets of the human-centered planet on a five-star scale. <laughs> and continuing my catalog of favorite things that are produced by uh, John Green, mm. uh, this is John Green's solo podcast, and uh, it's released, I think, monthly, uh, in which he takes two things in the Anthropocene and gives them a, a star rating. Like, for example, episode five, Hawaiian Pizza, and viral meningitis. And he <laughs> he talks about each of those things and then gives them a review. Or how about Lasco paintings and the Taco Bell breakfast menu? <laughs> sure. And then do you have to figure out what they all have in common? Or <laughs> no, he just gives you a little sort of uh, a little essay about uh, these things, the impact on humanity, and then says, "I give it a three star" or something like that. And it's it is super funny and witty and charming. It and sounds like it. it. Because I can draw a straight line between the Taco Bell breakfast and viral meningitis. Right. Just, you know, <laughs> that is right, right next to each other. Okay, there is. It's a long arc, but it does connect. <laughs> and and so it it really I think is going toward uh, this the you know uh, furthering the weight of the word Anthropocene in its place in popular culture. Like we're talking more about, uh, and I'm not saying directly result of this podcast, but I think just in general about the impact of humanity mm-hmm. on the planet. Mm hmm. How do you feel about the impact of humanity on the planet, Tom? Especially now, incredibly anxious about it. So much so that I just I sort of 
which is the worst thing to do. I go out of my way to not read full articles about how we have 10 years and then everything is going to be so irreversible. Uh, I actually am surprised we have 10 years. So, yes, it, it is very scary. Well, then this story is going to be a doozy for you. Okay. I'd like to read you uh, the stinkiest of stinky emails that has come across. Uh, in Please the stop last... saying that. It, it uh... actually came through. <laughs> <laughs> it actually just came through the day before yesterday, and I have been so excited to share it because it is so very timely. So this uh, is a listener submission? It is. Woo! Okay. What do you think about that? I'm excited. I love listener submissions. Okay. I'd like, to, I'd like to read this to you. Pete, I just finished season one of WTS as a late member of the community, and I'm thrilled that I don't have to wait all summer for season two. I finished the final episode of the season and went to open the news app on my phone only to find this article that captures the scope of my anxiety perfectly. And then he links to this article. He continues, whatever you think about politics, I have faith that, quote, we the people will figure out how to navigate the filthy waters of our own sullying. But what this article lays out is a set of conditions that makes me feel helpless, hopeless and anxious for the future of our species. I feel like we're far from the point of rescue, and now we need to start planning for our post-apocalyptic Mad Max future. I don't know why it feels therapeutic to write this to a podcast. Hope you guys have a little space to laugh about this one. Mark C. Thank you, Mark. The, the Thank article... you, Mark. I'm already chuckling. <laughs> well, yeah. The... Although I do love the phrase filthy waters of our own sullying. Oh, my nice God. Nice job, Mark That C. is amazing. I love that. Okay. Uh, so, Mark, the, the article that Mark posted was indeed the article that you already mentioned. The world has barely a decade to avoid disaster. We need to combat climate change now from the Washington Post. And it documents the uh, release of the the you know seven hundred page report to right. the uh, uh, climate council uh, and uh, for the UN is that where it came from? Uh, anyhow, the, this massive document that says you know what we're already pretty much too late. Uh, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, uh, released their report uh, that said you know we got to do some work to keep warming below two degrees celsius and it turns out uh, even though we've been saying that for years now we're telling you the clock is is really really ticking and we have about a decade to figure this out or if not sooner or things are going to get bad and how how bad are those things going to get well this, this here's a, a passage from this article the difference between 1.5 degrees and two degrees would be substantial Coral reefs would go from mostly gone to almost entirely gone. More sea level rise would put up to 10 million more people in danger. High heat would kill more people. It would be much hotter on land and in cities. Deadly mosquito-borne illnesses such as malaria and dengue fever would spread farther. Droughts would be more likely. So would deluges. Tropical fisheries would empty further. Stable, staple crop yields, particularly in some of the world's poorest nations, would decline more. Disastrous loss of Antarctic ice sheets would be more likely. Feedback loops could push warming further than anticipated as, for example, thawing permafrost releases gases from the frozen ground that has been trapped for centuries. Up to nearly one million additional square miles of permafrost would thaw at two degrees of warming. And that's so, where zombies come from. That's where, exactly <laughs> Absolutely. where zombies come from. It's not going to be cute like in Man. <laughs> it's no. just going to be just a virus. Well, see, that it, I feel like that might be one of the, I'm saying the most obvious thing, well, the biggest problem. That's such a cognitive dissonance to say, yeah. oh my gosh, two degrees. Yeah, like, right, two degrees, right. but it who is cares? Celsius, which is kind of a lot if you live Good point. here. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> we yeah, don't even yes. know how big that is. Right. You have to add 32 or something? I don't know. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's 67, actually. It's very weird. And there's a square. But I do wonder if sometimes like climate change deniers read that first part, like because you read it in order of a 1.5 to 2 degrees and yeah. stop reading because they're like, oh, shush. Oh, it's Call me when it's deal. 100 degrees. Yeah, right. 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 Yeah. My car still has a AC, you know, so right. I'm, not, exactly. I'm not really worried about that. Uh, and so, you know, this is... <laughs> This is one of those those things that's really hard to laugh about. I've been sitting here trying yeah. to figure out where's the <laughs> joke in global climate change, and uh, I assure you, I have not I have not found one. Um, it's because it's it's not funny and it's super scary, and so the laughing that I do is really the laughing that's all around, like not crying. <laughs> 
<laughs> so we're back to clowns. Yeah. Again, we've got our painted on smiles and inside we're all burning alive. Perfect. Well, okay. So let's talk let's talk just a little bit yeah. about what the anxiety, like what what is challenging us and, and where this anxiety comes from. And the the first one, and the thing that I think Mark has has highlighted there is the same thing that impacts me, and I think probably impacts you, which is this this feeling of of where is my control in this scenario, yeah. right? Yes. And that that you as an individual, you have very little direct control over climate change. <laughs> like if right. I could flip a switch, I would flip it. Uh, if I could just stop wearing, you know, pants and have everything go back to normal, I would stop wearing pants. Like I, there are things that I would do in my lifestyle that <laughs> if I could take control. Flip a switch and no pants. (laughs) (laughs) What if the Uh, next report came out and that was the answer? Oh, you'd be (laughs) you'd be eating your words then. (laughs) Are you kidding? Dare to dream, man. We just became the most popular podcast ever. (laughs) (laughs) It's all about like anxieties and prophecies here. Right. (laughs) On what's that smell? Well, we'll tell you what that smell is going to be. That's right. The, that's the real <laughs> gift of this show, uh, you know, because it's different than like anxiety around a uh, like a job that you hate, right, or a boss that you get. You can quit your job. You can take control of that experience and be done, right? You, right. you can't yeah. just quit climate change, right? Uh, and and there's a second one that's just, it's all about visibility, right? That there was a while when you might hear all these stats and be able to tune it out, right? Because it doesn't mm-hmm. necessarily affect you. And if you live in you know Los Angeles. Uh, probably, uh, you know, more likely than not, you're going to walk outside and it's going to be a pretty nice day. Right. Yes, right? always. So the increasing weather events that have made this sort of tune out more and more of a challenge, right? It's harder to hide because mm-hmm. we're actually seeing the impact. And in Los Angeles, again, in California in general, uh, part of it is that the the state is less resilient to heat, right? right. Things we're light always on fire. On fire. And we're always on, on fire. fire. Yes, exactly. absolutely. Yeah. We're number one. It, you are number one. Go <laughs> California. And, and that leads to number three, which is impact, right? There's this direct and indirect impact. The likelihood of people and infrastructure that you rely on being impacted by climate change, it's going up, right? If you've ever had a FedEx package delayed because of weather in Tennessee, uh, you've been impacted. If you've had a cousin stranded in a Houston high rise for a week due to flooding, you've been impacted. If you've lost your home or belongings or loved ones in fires and floods, you've been directly directly impacted and these direct impacts of these events it, it's it's always been high but we're in this time where indirect impacts are increasing thanks to pace and scale of these mm-hmm. events and that's the thing that, that it's it's harder to it's getting harder to deny i think or at least i like to think right God, and then i watch the news and it's so dumb <laughs> so stop stop watching all news and take off your pants that- <laughs> oh, I would give anything for just you to play the ending song. And like, that's, that's it. You play the ending song. We never do another episode. It's just take off your pants. And then that's it. Over. Okay, yeah. good. Do you think, unfortunately, that that is what it's going to take? The examples you gave ex- escalated really quick yeah. from my package is late to I've lost my entire house. Do you think that it's going to have to take somewhere in the middle of that? To make people well, really stand up and believe in it? I don't know. Let me ask you. I mean, have you? who yeah. do you know who's been impacted on any of those three uh, levels? A lot of travel. You did say, I think that someone was, oh, no, you didn't. You said uh, a package. But I and a lot of people that I know have been affected by severe weather. And therefore, it just has this ripple effect of airports throughout the entire United States. And people have been stranded at times for days. And... A lot. I think the easy thing to do is weather is weather, but weather isn't weather. (laughs) Weather is weaponizing itself because we're jerks. So that's the first thing. I'm sure that there's a ton more, uh, but that's the first thing that uh, definitely comes to mind. Well, I'm, you know, I'm just thinking. I, I was thinking about myself when I wrote those examples, right? Of course, I've had a FedEx package delayed, right? I mean, you get online, it says weather event in South Carolina means you can't get your goodie, whatever it is, right? (laughs) Uh, And and you know, I did. My cousin was stranded in his condo in in houston uh for days and days and days during the flooding and Ooh. and and you know it was one of those like weird first world examples of being stranded due to weather because he couldn't get out of his building but right. he's also a telecommuter for a great big international company and he just worked he had enough ramen and was able to just continue to work as literally the city was drowning and and so oh. 
My uncle, of course. Uh, my uncle Jay. Um, uh, he recently moved, but he has lived in Florida, Jacksonville, Florida, for years and years and years. And every year, there comes a time because he's one of those people that decides not to evacuate. He yeah. boards himself up into his house. Yep. And stays there, there as the entire house and the roof is sort of torn up. And then he gets out and he fixes it. And that happens yearly. And it's only getting worse. <laughs> okay. It's only getting worse. There yeah. you go. I mean, that's the direct impact. So now we have people who are important to us and the impact on their lives is going to start impacting ours. Right. Because at some mm -hmm. point, you know, we we go down to Louisiana and we help rebuild those communities. We go down to Florida and, and Texas and we help rebuild those communities, it, um, you know, per, more so when we're directly impacted to it. But certainly churches and response groups and and yeah. you know they they do these this good work but i i did a book pick not long ago uh, for a book called the ends of the world right the the five great extinctions well i have now finished that book and one of the things that came out of the end of that book that the the message was that the odds of extinction uh, go up when the rate of change in the environment uh, increases beyond the rate of adaptability of a species. Ooh. So how long is it going to take us to continue to fix the places that are destroyed after these weather events come through versus change the way we live right. such that we adapt to the to the environment uh, beyond us? So at what point is Uncle Jay going to stop boarding himself up in his right. house and just yeah. move to the 45th parallel? <laughs> like, let's go inland, man. Right. Like, there is room to fit. There, There is an answer to these kinds of things. Um, and, and so... Uh, anyhow, those are but those that's, are kind but of the that big is three. a terrible answer a in terrible the long answer. term, though, because we'll all meet in the middle, <laughs> and <laughs> and weather will keep coming. <laughs> well, that's what they're that's what they're saying, right? Is that everything's yeah. gonna it, like really? You want to be right around the forty fifth parallel if you want to avoid all this stuff. Mm -hmm. It's not too hot, not too cold. It's the Goldilocks zone, and I don't know how we're gonna fit all those people in. Then we're gonna be. In the stacks or, or Detroit, in, uh, right? Yeah, in, right. Uh, Ready Player One. Ex right. That's exactly where we're going to be. So there, there, uh, there's been a lot of conversation about this, and psychologists have tried to explain uh, responses to this kind of of anxiety. And there's this wonderful psychologist, uh, Dr. Renee Lertzman, who says that you know this this kind of uh, this increased awareness is leading to a lot of anxiety and trauma and fear, particularly people as they have this greater direct impact, uh, and uh, she says people tend to respond to dire scientific projections in one of two very different ways. And there's very little gray area between the two. They're either they double down on optimism. Yay. Clean energy, technology, recycling, hope. Right. All this great mm -hmm. stuff. Yep. Or they are completely nihilistic about it. Right. Oh, Mr. Shot. Nothing matters. Smoke if you got them. We're done. <laughs> Put a fork in it. We're done. I'm going to put go on another it. pair of pants. Exactly. <laughs> more, oh, that's really more laughing pants in the face of it. <laughs> for all of it. Yeah, exactly. She says we have this innate need and desire to feel like we're good people. Uh, but if if we experience conflict between our desire to be a good person and our desires, the things we want to do with our life and travel and the things that we want to to the, the gadgets we want, the things that we know are not cool. Uh, yeah. you know, environmentally, that leads to cognitive dissonance and that amps your need to pick a side, the, the sure. optimist or the nihilist. And, and generally, you're going to be a nihilist. And because it's the millennials who are looking around saying, hey, we kind of feel like you painted a target on our back. And statistics right. show that, you know, now 77 percent in a recent conservative poll, 77 uh, percent of young voters think we should try to stop or slow climate change, uh, <laughs> including 89% Democrats, 77% independents, and 57% of Republicans uh, say we need to take action, that we have a responsibility, and more importantly, we have the tools at our disposal to make change. And okay. we're going to vote on that, right? We're going to come to the polls and we're going to vote with that in mind. So that that actually, honestly, gives me a little bit of hope. That gives me enormous hope if if they actually go out and vote. But I do think that there is there there is room for hope and uh, and, and not just, you know, paralyzing pantsless fear. Um so yeah, there are also some things that that we can do. And and, you know, I, we, I know this is not a, a science show necessarily but if you you know there are, there are people who experience climate change very directly and and 
uh, the the science of, for example, you mentioned travel. The science of travel mm -hmm. uh, says that you know getting in an airplane and running that airplane across the sky, uh, you know, at the scope and scale that we run airplanes across the sky, is a significant impact on um, on the world. So, what are the cultural changes that are that are required for that? One, there are dramatic work changes. We've got to change what we expect of people to be in places at specific times, and maybe that means change the way uh, we adapt to um, you know remote work and sure. telework and those sorts of things. Manufacturing and shipping is a, a challenging thing. We need to figure out what are the alternative technologies is this tesla is is uh or, or elon musk hyperloop the big answer for hmm. um energy efficient shipping of large quantities of products around the world maybe we need to be doing some more investment in that kind of stuff rather than boats and planes right you know or are we going to see a change where people end up staying a little bit closer to home so you don't have these mad dashes at, at travel season uh for everybody to travel around the world to be with family maybe they're already with family um, mm, you know, sure. that's, that's one of those other impacts. How do you, how can you take a, an individual action and, in, uh, you know, to change your climate footprint? I don't know, but I, I have to say like, it, it's, it's not great in my experience, taking action somehow, uh, makes, allows you to reclaim a little bit of that control. When I talked about voting, it's easy sometimes to feel like, well, if it's just me, what difference will that really make? What difference does one vote make? But when we're, especially when we're all geared up about voting now, the whole message is one vote makes an enormous difference. And so one house that does recycle or compost, yeah. I mean, that it, hopefully that that really can make a huge difference. Well, it um, does, it, it, it makes a direct difference in how you feel about your sure. level of impact, <laughs> even if it doesn't point. make a direct, you know, and measurable impact on. Sure. Uh, you know, on the Nate, the state of of environmental science. But one of the interesting things that came out of this is that, it, you know, the impact of climate change actually, you know, has a direct impact on our individual health, which is, you know, heat uh, mm. it, it changes, dramatic changes in heat make people more ir irritable, makes them more aggressive to each other and to themselves. Pollution harms our health and exacerbates psychiatric psychiatric symptoms of anxiety and bipolar disease and obsessive compulsive disorders uh that um you know all of these things are the dominoes that fall in, in order as we lose control of our planet uh we lose control of ourselves and our own anxiety and that is something that i i, I think is worth uh sure is, is worth thinking clearly about not funny take off your pants <laughs> So thank you, Mark, for thank writing you, Mark. in. Yeah, this Yeesh. was a real downer, and uh, you're not alone. We knew we were going to have to deal with this at some point, and there's not a real fun way to dress this one up. <laughs> no, <laughs> but it's important to to bring up, and thank you so much for bringing that. Much like dealing with climate change, we knew we would have to deal with climate change on the podcast. It's kind of a meta approach to uh, to making a contribution <laughs> to climate health, but we feel really good that we did it. Yeah, we can't make it funny. That's the job of our children and our children's children. <laughs> I'm sure I'm sure they'll figure it out just like climate change. <laughs> Peter, you know how sometimes you have a really serious anxiety that is important in the world, and then I have a dumb one? <laughs> Guess what? <laughs> that's that's about to happen again. <laughs> you just talked about the coming, the end of the world. Climate apocalypse. Now, climate apocalypse, and now I'm going to talk about mine. <laughs> Big stuff. Oh, All good. right. But hopefully it will be relatable. If not, oh well. Goodbye, listeners. <laughs> <laughs> All right, how about, for mine, we start off with a quick game. Oh, good. Games. Okay. I, I'm going to start reading a list of things, and you yell out when you think you know what they all have in common. And I'll just keep going, and when you're right, I'll stop. Ready? Okay. <clears throat> a dress shirt. Eye drops. Jeans. A hat. Sneakers. Hair gel. Terrible props in a claymation movie. <laughs> Medication. Dress shoes, tie, toothpaste, <laughs> comb, <laughs> socks. Now I just gotta want to see how far books, you get. <laughs> razor, belt, passport, toothbrush. Okay, I'm gonna stop. Tra trap things that you pack when you go traveling. 
Close. These are all things I've desperately needed but have forgotten to pack <laughs> while traveling throughout my life. And trust me, the list goes on and on, but I'm going to stop at toothbrush. Uh, <laughs> Pete, if you know me, <laughs> you know I love to travel. And I've been very lucky and hashtag blessed to see a fair amount of the world uh, because my parents are very loving and they uh, always put travel as a priority for us. And the travel is great. And once I arrive in a new strange place, I see it as an adventure and I love to go and explore it and figure it out either on my own or with friends or with family. There's no anxiety there, but the packing Pete, mm -hmm. <laughs> Oh my God, for some reason, since I was an adult that was in charge of doing it myself, I have always had an anxiety of packing for a trip. Can I just ask why your voice cracked like a 12 year old when you said, <laughs> since I was old enough to do it myself, why did that happen? <laughs> I, two things. Number one, I'm going through puberty again. <laughs> I'm very excited about it. Number two, as I was reading that, I literally was just remembering your anxiety, the listener anxiety about the end of the world. And I'm talking about packing. I can't get, I can't get over. I hate the order that these are going in. <laughs> this is such a de-escalation. But maybe that's what we need in these hard times. It is. Tom, okay. We need to talk about this. This is important. Okay. This is huge. Um, <laughs> so packing for a trip, anxiety. What am I afraid? I'm afraid I'm going to pack the wrong clothes and be uncomfortable. I'm worried that I won't have the right outfit for a certain event. I'm afraid of forgetting something. Uh, all of these I have been worried about for most of my life. And that last item on the list, uh, do you remember what it was? The toothbrush? Yeah. I just forgot that on my last trip, Pete. And that was to <laughs> New York. And that was yesterday. <laughs> I'm 43. It's not getting better, Pete. It's not getting any better. All right. There is no actual true diagnosis for this anxiety that I can find. Mm, really? But it sounds like people on the <laughs> it sounds like people on the internet, shut up, have decided on packing anxiety disorder. And before you continue making fun of me, PAD, packing anxiety disorder, people have decided it is a real thing. And on the internet, we are legion. <laughs> I am not, I am not alone. So how dare you, you cackling jerk? Now, maybe I don't need to bring this up. Pete, do you have any relation to this? Let, I'm guessing not. No, no I'm going to tell you right now. I'm going to tell you the truth. Yeah. Yes, I do. Really? Yeah, oh, but it's, okay. so, it's so fun and easy to, to laugh at you about it. I know. Uh, because that's what we do. But let me tell you, <laughs> I, but it's, I, I don't know. It's, yeah, I think it's a sub anxiety. This is, this makes me actually maybe weirder than you. It's not a packing anxiety per se. It's a TSA anxiety related to my stuff. Oh, that you have to unpack it for them or that they're going to go through yes. everything? Yes. Oh, sure. I hate it. I hate it. And I, I don't even mind. Like, it's not as if I have a weird, like, problem with showing off my, you know, stuff in a bin. But I have a just like I hate the whole idea of taking out all my crap and having to keep keep track of it. Maybe it's this an ADHD thing, like I'm not going to be able to focus well enough under pressure when they're asking questions about where my <laughs> which little pocket my phone was in. Do I have anything in my pockets before I walk through the magnetic cancer machine? Like I just there's too much. <laughs> there's just too much. And it's all related to all the crap I take. And, and, and it's all hurry up, hurry up. And there's people oh, yeah, and you're grumpy. Up. And it's oh, like, yeah. don't blow mm -hmm. this. And yeah, no. I don't even yeah. wear shoes anymore to travel because it's like I don't want anything to take off. It's just another thing. So I just barefoot for 36 hours. That's <laughs> oh, not <gross>. entirely true. <laughs> but I do wear travel friendly shoes. Uh, but look, yep. I, it, it's made even uh, even worse because I try to simplify packing. Mm. It used to be I always check my bag because that's where the liquids go. Sure. Uh, but now I'm trying to go more on this minimalist. See, you you poked a dragon with this one, man. I, I was Apparently. trying to stay cool, but it, I have things. But now I've gone to this minimalist travel. I got this Tom Bin backpack that I love and it has all these little pockets that are on rails and chains and things. You can slide it out so it all stays. And it's it's so great. But now I'm wow. carrying liquids and now I have to have a clear bag of, yep. of liquids and toothpaste type stuff. And that causes me even more anxiety. Anxiety. Tom, I don't know what to do. <laughs> There's nothing to do, Pete. <laughs> if it helps at all, based on your anxiety, it's all going to be over very soon. Now, <laughs> so, okay, so it's not the exact kind of thing that I was talking about, but it is definitely involved because it involves having to pack or repack all of your stuff. Of course, the best thing to do is to make a list or even a spreadsheet with everything that you might need. Uh, and you can have that as a separate on your computer or just alone on a piece of paper and you can check things off so you don't forget. 
And I've been doing that for a while. Sounds great, right, Pete? Totally. Usually a big help. But I would like to share a very quick anecdote of why I'm an idiot. Just a few years ago, I was going to a wedding with friends in Chicago. Um, and because it was a wedding with a pretty tight turnaround, it added extra anxiety to my normal packing anxiety because I really had to make sure I didn't forget anything I needed. It's a wedding. There's people there. <laughs> As you do. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we had a wedding block reserved for us at the hotel. So after I'd made sure that I was all set with that, I could just go to my list and I checked off everything on my list and I double checked and triple checked. Wander. I do this thing where I wander around my apartment once I'm packed the night before the flight, just looking at things, <laughs> wondering, do I need that? Like, is there anything that will jog my memory that I need? I had everything that I needed. It was time for the flight. I landed in Chicago. I met my friends and everything seemed grand. This was the night before the wedding um and i met my friends and we all went together to check into the hotel and that's when i realized i actually never had reserved a room at the hotel (laughs) i was so anxious about not forgetting to pack anything i forgot shelter (laughs) shelter that wasn't on my little spreadsheet toothbrush was but shelter no and so i went there and i said hi i'm here for the wedding they said we don't care those rooms are long gone long gone this was months before that i had to do this and i said but i really want to come here and they were like no no the only room that they had was available was 900 dollars a night obviously not an option so yeah sadly with like the uh charlie brown music like i just trudged out of the fancy hotel luckily i found an affordable hotel like three blocks away but that meant every morning for this three-day trip i would uh wake up have to add 20 minutes to my schedule to leave my hotel that was not serving breakfast and watch my friends finish their free breakfast at their fancy (laughs) hotel and then they'd come out and meet me and we'd go uh explore chicago so even even with a list and a spreadsheet my idiocy prevails shelter wow. i have to add that now to a list you have to shelter add that to a list. how sad is that i am okay. a big fan of of automated packing lists and i think that yeah. is a great thing and i have one too it's sitting in my to-doist and whenever i have a trip i just duplicate that project and mm-hmm. zero out everything and then i have a template for a trip I am going to add shelter to mine now, (laughs) just in case. Because it's like, you're never going to forget it. But when you do, Pete, it changes (laughs) you. It really changes you. Like now, every time I leave the apartment, like, do I have everything I need to stay alive? Um (laughs) Yes, the, the, the list is the number one, and I have a couple tips that I've uh, been able to find that are apart from the most obvious tips. We'll share those a little bit later, but I wanted to talk about why I think we, and again, if you look online, there are a lot of us. There's a huge amount of people that have packing anxiety disorder, um, and I think I wanted to go over maybe why I think we have anxiety over it. I have it boiled okay. down to, of course, as when I say this, nothing I ever say is profound. I'm sure all of these are cliched, but I said it. Uh, number one, it's a, it's a fear of change. Uh, obviously if I forget a toiletry or something, I can always buy it in this other place. Right. Or if I forget a shirt, I can buy one, but it'll be changed. What if they don't have what I need? And I, the stuff that I have and I wear from home, I know it works. I don't really know if this other city, Chicago, it's not like I'm going to this weird <laughs> outpost, but still, it's not exactly uh, what I'm used to. And so right. I think that might be part of it. For me, do you ver- have on your list, like, find out from locals if I have to hunt and kill my own food in <laughs> Chicago? Do. Yeah, like, what plants do I take <laughs> if I have allergies? Like, I have to go into a forest. Um Another one that really hits me is actually the fear of social, causing social problems. I guess it would Uh be just social anxiety, either being a burden in slowing travel companions down while I remake all the stuff that I forgot to pack, or I let them go ahead and I have to go out in the town and find my stuff and I'll miss out on something fun or memorable while I get my stuff together. Again, these are pretty irrational fears and very small, but I'm just trying to figure out what's at the base of it. What am I really wow. worried about? Yeah. And of course, the last one is probably the most obvious. It's just fear of the unknown. That whenever we're going to a new place, even though, as I said, it's an adventure, it's still the things that you bring from home are like a security blanket. They make yeah. you feel safe. So you feel like you can go out and explore and get lost in a city. That, that gentle um, sense of familiarity. Exactly. Of home. Yeah. Um, and it occurred to me to no- to have broken out those three My hope for myself and then maybe for listeners is that knowing that that kind of anxiety, it might just be an old fear. 
like an old primal fear that's not as important as you think. Uh, it's not as you're not really worried about forgetting that shirt. You're worried about the unknown. And yeah. so maybe it drains some of the seemingly importance of that. And you can just, yeah, you can buy a new shirt. Let's do this. <laughs> That's my hope. I have a, a very high uh, travel anxiety. I don't, I don't, I feel like every major step in travel, like just leaving the house on time reduces my anxiety a little bit. Getting to security and getting checked in and getting to the other side reveal, re- reduces a little bit. So my entire day is like uh, a giant thermometer cooling off uh, <laughs> until I get wherever I'm going. And layovers, forget layovers. I'm a hot mess with layovers. So don't even talk to me. I'm terrible. That'd be a that'd be a good name for a restaurant in an airport for layovers. Just hot mess. Hot mess. Just like take a seat. <laughs> I thought yeah. you were going to say, "Don't even talk to me. I'm terrible." What would you like <laughs> on the menu? It's just regret and silence. <laughs> and Some tepid every, tap water and white bread. And like every order comes with a, with a toothbrush, just in case. <laughs> just in case. If you're looking for actual practical tips, apart from the anxiety, to either help you feel better or to actually be able to pack better, you can look on uh, the internet. I would suggest looking up uh, tips from flight attendants or tips from pilots. That's where I got uh, a lot of different tips. One that really stuck out for me was that stewardesses and pilots, they always have a small bag filled with toiletries and absolute necessities that they never take out of their suitcase. They just have a duplicate part. So they have all of their toiletries in their restroom and then at home and then in their bag, they always have this go bag ready to go. So there's no chance. So all they have to do is add clothes and there's no chance to ever forget something like a toothbrush. That seems kind of smart. Oh, yeah. I love the whole go bag concept, too. It makes me feel like I'm like Jack Bauer. Yeah. You know, like I'm just ready for anything. Yep. Yeah. I like that, too. So play yeah. spy, play spy yeah. and be like, like, yeah, I you've got your once a year. <laughs> you know, with any right. significance. Yeah. And so I can just imagine putting a bunch of clothes and stuff in there and then actually getting to my destination and discovering, A, I'm I'm now way too fat and none of my right. clothes that were in my go bag fit. Right. And, you know, does deodorant get stale? I don't know. Right. What's you the, for, what is you the forgot grossest that you re- outcome? <laughs> well, you, you, you packed a bunch of sandwiches. <laughs> yeah. I would think. <laughs> well, like that, all that jelly? That chowder didn't hold up. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, something that I have learned that might be incredibly obvious, but I learned it a little bit late at night, is that hotels, almost every hotel has a ton of toiletries that they will give you for free because people forget stuff all the time. And that's everything from hair gel to lip balm to toothpaste, toothbrushes across the board. If you just go to the front desk, they just have this huge uh, care package waiting for you. And if you're a cheap creep, you can just go down and add to your uh, collection if you want, (laughs) whenever you want. What would so great about that is they give you just everything, right? Yeah. They they don't just give you a toothbrush. They give you everything in a little sachet yeah like like shower caps what's yeah, a shower right. cap what's for shower- i'm not a, yeah i don't even get it uh and about clothes and this is something that i have had to convince myself uh and it's starting to work but this is just for me that ultimately apart from like a key event and this is about clothes apart from a key event like a wedding where you really have to get dressed up no one is ever going to care about what you're wearing as much as you do Everyone's dealing with packing and what to wear. So no one's examining you. No one's judging you as much as you think. You can wear some of the same clothes a lot. Washing machines do exist. If you have a two-week trip, pack for one week at most. Uh, I would think that uh, really take some of that pressure off. Unless you're an Instagram person, uh, you don't have to worry so much. You're just driving yourself up the wall. And If you're an Instagram person... Maybe consider not being that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> also, think about the choices you've made. Uh, and no one cares about your omelet. Right. Um, <laughs> and Too much so, pressure. Yeah. So, yes, this is... I actually, while I was in New York, I did work in, on writing up the notes for this anxiety when I forgot my tooth, toothbrush. And I'm actually going to try to, for once, use some of these ideas <laughs> for my life. Because even in New York, I packed like an idiot. I have too many clothes. My suitcase is bursting with clothes that I never wore, and I forgot a toothbrush, Pete. Mm. But isn't it, isn't it how nice sometimes that these ideas for your contribution to this show they just like they just come to you so easily? What it's do you just mean? Easy, like it's just from your experience through your through your hand to your pen. Yes, it, you may travel like an, an idiot child, but my goodness, do you know how to contribute to the anxiety catalog? <laughs> That's weird. I am a walking physician, <laughs> heal thyself, inspirational poster. I'm so I'm just the worst. Thank you. 
Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash scent of a podcast. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, your Android device, your Kindle or MP3 player. Fantastic service. Oh, Tom, I am just eating up audiobooks this week. What are you listening to? I am listening to a wonderful book that I'm really enjoying. It's called The Power by Naomi Alderman. And why I wanted to bring it up this week is because it is very much in tune with a female dystopian fiction. Have you heard of The Power? I've never, not even a little bit, never oh, heard of it. I think you'll like it. Number one, it comes with a blurb from Margaret Atwood on the cover. Oh, uh, we know she's the patron saint of female dystopian fiction. <laughs> exactly. It's not necessarily a dystopia in that it is, doesn't take place in the future, but it sort of suggests an alternative reality where what happened if women all of a sudden possessed a fierce, new, almost paranormal power uh, for reasons that are pretty much unexplained, but it could just be evolutionary, all of a sudden uh teenage girls now have an immense physical power i won't explain what the power is because it'll be better to hear on your own but they can all all of a sudden cause agonizing pain and even death in certain situations and with this small twist of nature the entire world drastically resets it is really really thrilling again it's the power by naomi alderman and i highly recommend it i think you should put it on your list pete it's very exciting it's already in my wish list tom as i speak i have already added it to my wish list that's that's i'm definitely going to listen to it in the next month Excellent. I think you and our listeners will enjoy it. It is 12 hours and five minutes long. So I personally listened to it as I wandered around my apartment getting ready to pack for New York. <laughs> that's how long <laughs> That's how long I just go back and forth and back and forth and then forget things that are very, uh, very obvious. For you, the listeners of What's That Smell? Audible is offering a free audiobook download with a free 30-day trial to give you the opportunity to check out their service and listen to over 180,000 titles, samples, and see what you think. See what you think. You know they've got this new thing, uh, the Audible Originals. Are you familiar with this? I don't think so. What is that? I want to I talk to you about the Audible Originals. It's this new thing they're they're producing that you can only get on Audible. And if you sign up for a subscription, then you can download two of these new Audible Originals a month and not use credits. Uh, and I just listened to a new one called Lullaby. It's actually a 36-minute short story by Jonathan Mayberry. It's a ghost story, and it's Ooh. super spooky. And it is included in your membership. So if you choose to stick around with Audible, you can listen to Tom's story about girls who can kill people and (laughs) my story about ghosts. And uh, happy uh, October, everybody. And remember, we don't pay to advertise this show. So please, the best thing you can do, apart from, of course, giving us a five-star review in iTunes or Apple Podcasts, is share it with your friends. Tell just one person. If each one of you tells one person about this podcast, we will be up to like a dozen listeners. (laughs) So let's do this, everybody. (laughs) Help us get up to that sweet, sweet 20 listeners. And we will thank you forever but please thank you very much share the love with the review and just share the podcast wherever you want coming up next week yeah hey. oh, hey, you CBD. CBD. <laughs> oh, yeah i keep it in my man bun mm, would you like a gummy i have it right here <laughs> my hot pocket let's be clear unless you are a scientist right. it's not science <laughs> you're just throwing crap on the wall <laughs> no every time i smile when i'm nervous i am a scientist This week's tune is For the One by Eldar Kadem. Thank you all so much for listening. I'm Tommy Mess III. And I'm Pete Wright. We'll be back next week on What's That Smell? We can go any place that we want to I don't care if that's too far Take my hand and let's fly away To another galaxy Hold me close, I want to feel your love Together we are free Just be with me Just be with me Just be with me